Good morning, fellow nerds. Good to see you back on this Thursday morning. I'm Jeff Doyle uh, with uh, another episode of Between Two Nerds. And with me is my uh, my co-host, my co-worker, my friend, my, gosh, my reason for being, uh, Jeff Tansura. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. And, you know, my cheek just went red. <laughs> <laughs> I love you that much. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, well, you probably all notice that we have uh, not just the two of us this morning. This is something we, it's our first time doing this on this show, is having a guest. And, and we're very honored um, uh, with the guests that we've got here. Jeff, you want to you wanna do the introductions? Absolutely. It would be my pleasure to introduce Tony P., longtime friend, ex scholar, been working together forever. I think that was the reason he came back to U.S., hopefully. Tony P., <laughs> uh, well-known entity in routing world, uh, ex-chair of uh, ISS working group, been working on protocols for the last 55 years, and the brain behind Drift. So, Tony, it's a pleasure to have you here. This is definitely not the last meeting. We see you here, so get used to us. Great to see you. Welcome, Tony. Thanks. Thanks. Always a pleasure. So uh, if you uh, have looked up the uh, Internet draft on Rift, um, hopefully you have from our last show, Jeff and I did just a very uh, high level overview of Rift. And, and we're obviously continuing now. But you'll see that that Tony is the uh, editor, the leader, however you want to say that. Of um, um, of that um, internet draft, and so we're really privileged uh, to be able to hear um, uh, directly from the horse's mouth um, uh, some details of of riffs, as as you can see on the screen here, operational advantages and. Uh, 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 uptake in the industry, where Rift is going, why uh, uh, why we feel that there's a need for a new routing protocol and uh, and all of that. And if you haven't watched the previous podcast, we went in details about what's available in data centers today, what are some advantages of running BGP or SPF or SS, what are disadvantages, and what led us to actually development of new routing protocol. So Tony, please go ahead, take it from here and let's talk about Rift. Yeah, sure. Hey everyone. Um, don't see who is on. I assume there is vast, you know, swaths of people holding their breath, wanting to know everything about it. Well, now why do we thousands of people? Thousands of people show up for this. Yeah, oh, well, routing, you know, there was always widely popular, you know, since, you know, we were beating the Beatles sometimes in terms of venues. Um, well, while Coming we... back to PNNI, yeah, remember the song? Yeah, PN... PNNI was actually some of the nicest venues that we were hanging out, you know, ATM forums, were... there was a classy, that was a classy show as long as it lasted. Um, well, why a new routing protocol? Because what will I do otherwise? Uh, no, or, or in other words, if you didn't find routing, you didn't find any serious networking problem yet, right? Um, no, routing is, uh, you know, a technology that is morphing um, into a lot of different uh, technological fields. Um, you see not only things like Rift, you see, you know, brilliant things like Ripple, which are, you know, deployed for a very particular purpose. Um, so ITF, in a sense, uh, and I think it's a good development, starts to build uh, purpose-built uh, routing solution, right? We, we kind of solved the problem that was posed in the 90s when the distributed uh, forwarding or networking came to fore, because before that everything was centralized. Telephony networks, I mean, who heard about distributed routing? I mean, that, well, there were some instances, but it was considered, you know, like a corner crazy stuff, right? Um, so we, the problem, internet problem was sparsely connected meshes, and that's what we solved, right? And that's kind of the only hammer that we had to hit every nail. But now we have things, fields coming like IoT, we have special security requirements, mobility requirements, Wi-Fi, this, for example, Babel work, right? 
an excellent protocol just for Wi-Fi that beats the pants of any other routing solution when they're testing on something like Battle Mesh. Um, so um, Rift is something, um, and that's because you know um, my my view is or, or no, what I was observing uh, since quite a long time is that we have to provision an enormous amount of bandwidth. Uh, so I think the days of artisanal network topologies. Um, will be coming to an extent to an end. I mean, there, there, there will be still enough of that, right? I mean, the WAN links will be always you know, expensive, and when you have long connectivity, um, uh, you know, the meshes are irregular because your geography is your destiny, right? When you start to talk about local um, locality, and what I mean locality is where you have producers, server farms, producing content, delivering content, and where you have locality, let's say a city, where you have a, uh, you know, something which is localized in terms of you know, like a metropolitan area network, uh, geography is not your destiny, right? Stuff is relatively local. So you can build regular structures. And with regular structures, it's much easier to provision large amount of that stuff and consume it. And you know, we consume an enormous amount of bandwidth, right? And let's leave satellite networks and Wi-Fi aside, right? Because it's its own game, but in terms of being in a building and provisioning a lot of bandwidth, uh, we basically build in telephony networks again, funny enough, right? Because a, a, a router or a switch is nothing else but a crossbar, uh, conceptually speaking. And when we strip those things together, we basically, uh, you know, putting crossbars together. And putting crossbars together is mathematically fairly well understood in terms of uh, behavior, blocking behavior and the cost of doing something like that, and it's the claw. It's 9056, right? Um, there are other solutions like um, hypercubes, right? But they are mostly geared towards or things like jellyfish. They mostly work better if you talk about uh, NUMA, right? So very tightly uh, coupled small systems, let, let's say rack size to rack size. The moment the links start to grow longer and they are not uniform, right? There's more bandwidth at the top. Then you start to find basically claw again. And I, I, I know what, what started to become obvious that people that will be building a lot of bandwidth out of switches and routers will be starting to build more and more claw. And we see that stuff, you know, as a network architecture uh, taking foothold in more and more areas. You know, satellite networks, I see, for example, people, satellite access networks like the terrestrial part, uh, cable networks, they go more and more from head ends and one link along blind. I see more and more people starting to build claw networks, right? So. When, um, you know, I was talking to the data center guys or like the first data center guys since more than 20 years and um, they were struggling finding a good routing solution. That was what I was seeing, right? Probably custom, custom built for, for the requirements that such a claw architecture poses. Um, uh, so originally they were doing Mac over Mac, things like that, and they started to do routing and the BGP because that's something you could hack easily, you know, and they got twisted in funny ways. Um, but when I looked at what the people would really consume easily and would really like, um, you know, it turned out to be new routing protocol. We were uh, originally thinking of modifying ISIS, and for a couple of our historical reasons, um, we ended up with a new protocol, went all the way. Um, ISI is modified to the extent that was needed would have not been compatible with ISI, as normal ISI is by any you know, means, as far as I've seen. So uh, why even bother, right? You can just start from scratch, which is a little bit of radical, hey, but you know, it's just work. So we put something together which turns out has a lot of operational advantages when you put it, you know, on a claw, claw-like architecture. Um, uh, so, of course, we built an open IETF standard. That's kind of Juniper way, right? Uh, so uh, you can build, you know, fabrics out of multiple vendors and, you know, the draft has a good amount of different uh, people on it from industry. Um, so we got a good amount of review, you know, open source implementation, uh, really good people got attracted to that and, uh, you know, it takes a village to be a protocol, right, of that complexity. It's not just something you quickly dream up, you know, in, a, in, in, in your bedroom and then just roll it out. Um, uh, so one thing, operational advantage is not that's more implementation advantage. We went all the way and we basically modeled the whole protocol, including packet formats and so on. 
And that allows us to uh, not only modify the protocol much faster, it also removes enormous amount of implementation problems that you have with parsers and encoders that we traditionally find, right? Um, which is historically speaking understandable because bandwidth and processing were extremely expensive in memory, which they are not today, even on relatively small boxes. I mean, the amount of CPU, the amount of memory is just stunning, right? And the links are so fast, especially in something like cloth fabric, it's pointless to go and squeeze, you know, non-orthogonal encodings where at the end people, you know, the semantics of some bits interacting with each other are not clear. But that's more, you know, um, implementation-wise because we also need to ship those protocols changes very quickly. The, the people building clone networks, especially data center guys, they have no patience for the traditional six months delivery cycles of, you know, routing protocol vendors. So Rift, and we can talk about our implementation where it's, for example, decoupled from uh, Junos and Evo, so it's basically a package you can always upgrade. But the model-based encoding uh, allows you to move at incredible speed compared to like arguing, you know, bits and packet formats. Um, but uh, okay, operationally, when you start to use it, what, what are the things that um, I think were appealing or people were looking for, and sometimes this stuff wasn't even vocalized, right? When you just looked operationally how people were dealing with building those things and uh, how, how much operational complexity they were soaking, right? Um, it, it was clear that things can be done better. So one of the things is that the protocol was built from the very bottom up on principles of ZTP. And when uh, I mean ZTP, I mean ZTP Ethernet style. Right? We do not configure Ethernet, we just plug those things together. So the idea is that you are having a protocol where you take lots of switches, pile them together, cable meets cable, and the thing comes up like an Ethernet fabric, right? But underneath, underneath you have IP forwarding because you need that for scale. We, we both know L2 doesn't scale, right? It's, that's the tragedy of it, right? So. Um, Spanning through all those things just go up to a certain size and are, you know, operationally have proven inferior at scale to, 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 you know, IP forwarding and routing. So the protocol is really from the very bottom, absolutely zero config uh, built. It's also built uh, for V4 over V6 forwarding. It's kind of a precondition uh, to solve that if you want ZTP, because V4 is impossible to ZTP. The, the address space is simply too small, right? It's not enough bytes to do real ZTP. So you have to solve the V4 over V6. And um, the other thing, the ZTP is you have to handle this cabling. People uh, plug clone networks the wrong way, right? And uh, you have to detect that because otherwise you'll be doing funky things. And it's not the fabric anymore, but the network that start to beha behave, you know, in um, irregular way, right? So you lose all your blocking probabilities, all your guarantees that you expect from such a fabric. That's why we talk about IP fabrics and not an IP network anymore, really. Um, uh, security, uh, uh, we, I mean, we're seeing that more and more security is, is becoming, uh, you know, a big topic. Uh, and uh, routing protocols, I mean, who cared in IP about security, right? Few people. And uh, we see what's going on recently, and it will only get worse, right? Because we put more and more valuable things onto those substrates. So we had to, from start on, to build the top security you can put into routing protocol, practically speaking. And we can talk about limitations, what it means practically speaking, right? Um, then um, the other thing is that um, if you start to look at how people are building these IP fabrics, Ideally, you like to have servers understanding routing. And the primary driver, well, so one driver is, of course, that we do a lot of virtualizations. A lot of addresses show up on the server and you somehow has, have to route them. So what you do if your server is L2, you somehow have to get them into the fabric. But you, you would say, well, that does not need the routing protocol, a decision, right, which way to go. Because the routing is ultimately, how do I get there, right, which way to go. So which way to go only starts to become a problem if you start to multi-home things or you have a lot of tunnels. Uh, let's not talk about the tunnels. Now, why would multi-homing make sense? Because if you serve a single home and we're talking stack of servers to a switch and you lose the switch, you are losing piles of server. And you know, stateless services are a nice idea, but you, and, I mean, it's somebody else's computer, so the services run somewhere 
and the recovery times, uh, you know, uh, is something that is not that easy to plan. So if you multi-home servers and you become independent of the failure in your network architecture in the sense that the server always has connectivity, you are solving a lot of problems. You know, one of them is, for example, rolling over your networking architecture. You know, you're rebooting your Tor and updating the stuff. You don't have to migrate services off the stack of servers, right? You can push up your reliability, service reliability, quite easily up. So you want to push routing to the server. And um, traditional routing was not built for that, right? The traditional routing means that you have a lot of bots and a lot of them. All of them participate in the topology, and all of them have a lot of stake. Well, the server is not there to run routing. But on the other hand, you know, it should have enough intelligence to deal with failures of the network, right? If the network is perfect, and you can send it left or right, uh, you just need the default route. But at a certain point in time, things fail. So the left may black hole you. So you, ha you have to know what is left or right. So how much information do you put on the server to actually solve the problem well? So Rift solves this problem, operationally speaking. So let, let me add a few points here and try to connect to what we've been discussing for last year or so. Uh, a lot of people are going to start their overlay on the server itself. What it really means is that you still need routing information underlay to resolve remote VTAP. So routing on the host in this case is mandatory probably you would be already running BGP VPN on the host anyway. Number two, and probably most significant driver is Kubernetes and containers. As you yeah. know, Kubernetes is L3 technology. It doesn't support anything at L2. It has to be routed. It has significant amount of information. You need to route blocks associated with Kubernetes pods, and it pretty much requires dynamic routing. And in most deployments model today, you would see something like Calico or other BGP implementation on the host that would exchange BGP routes with the fabric. So all of this leads us to the conclusion that routing on the host is mandatory and we need proper solution to do all homelet for resilience reason and being able to aggregate amount information and state we share with the servers. Right, so Jeff makes excellent point, right? The overlay extension is an excellent point, right? And uh, if you do routing naively and you put all your host routes on the server, uh, for small scale, it may work. It may even converge decently well, but you know, all the interesting problems start with scale. So uh, Rift solves the problems that you can put server into arbitrary size fabric and they actually end up with very minimal state, except when there are failures where, you know, Rift make sure that the routing decisions are resolved properly. Um, another thing that Rift solved is that, you know, because people went you know, the BGP route very often, uh, one of the interesting things with the fabric is that it would be very beneficial if you could just you know, have the topology of the fabric, like IGPs give you, right? So uh, Rift also gives you the IGP property that you can actually hook up at the top of the fabric and you see the whole topology and also, you know, what is wrong, what is miscabled, what is secure and so on. Uh, but you know those are those are uh, details. Operationally speaking, you you have one point you can hook up and see the topology of the fabric. Uh, yeah. And going back to one of our first shows, we discussed problems with aggregation uh, with BGP. So you don't know how much information. Actually, you do know. You cannot afford to aggregate because next 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 hop failure will result in black holing. So you end up either leaking all their 32s or going really complicated route. We've seen this in some uh, Asian hyperscalers. We don't want to go there, but practically you end up in binary situation where you either leak everything or leak nothing and use some over the top solution to actually figure out if next next hop is still available. Right, so Rift solves it basically automatically that you kind of leak just exactly the amount of information necessary so the server does the right you know uh, decision it doesn't have to see the full fabric it doesn't have to have all the prefixes it just gets enough in case of failure so it does the right thing um the other interesting property of rift the rift is built around the minimal blast radius concept right so if you run the flat igp uh you know igp likes to talk everywhere and if you start to uh, think about running areas on the fabric, IP fabric, actually the concept doesn't carry properly. Plus we only have two levels. And doing more levels is, well, we went and did it with PNNI. It is far more complicated than it looks, right? So there was some effort in IETF that by now I think fizzled out because, uh, 
you know, when you start to think through those details, it actually turns out far more complex than it looks, you know. Um, so Rift uh, gives you a minimal blast radius. So we'll, we'll talk in more detail, like who sees how much topology. Basically, it is built, built around, now comes a big word, but it's actually a cool word, something called epistemology. So it is built around who needs how much information to get their job done. And from there, the plot of protocol was developed. The, prince, the first principle was actually, how much information do I need? And then to get this information, what kind of protocol do I have to build? Rather than, oh, let's build a protocol and see how we can hack it until it kind of starts to behave the way we want it. So the blast radius is, of course, one of the preconditions for large scale, right? If everybody talks to everybody else pretty soon, you know, you do nothing by talking. And, and with Rift, you on failures and additional things, you only get the minimal blast radius. Okay. Um, Flood reduction, so that's a more a punctual thing. You know, if you start to run IGPs on the fabric, you 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 face the flood reduction problem pretty pretty quickly. And it's actually not only flood reduction; it's also flood balancing. We can talk about the stuff in detail. Just building flood reduction doesn't actually buy you much because you just generate hotspots. Um, so Rift solves that problem very elegantly. Um, the other thing that we observe on the fabric is that you have to adjust for asymmetric bandwidth. And it's not even that, you know, the server has a little bit more left, a little bit more right, and we really want, you know, to, 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 to balance that. I mean, Rift can do that. The real problem people are facing is that they have very fat links towards the top of the fabric. And if one of these fat links collapses, the fabric starts to behave very strangely, you know. So you have to get the servers to understand that and not load it towards, you know, tours, top of racks, that actually farther north have no bandwidth to push the stuff. But you have to rebalance it towards the tor that at the top of the fabric have much more bandwidth. So Rift solves that. And the problem is far, far more complex than it looks because traditional routing is, built by shortest, uh, is bound by shortest path, right? So you can't really take bandwidth into account properly. An interesting property of Rift is that it is a value free routing protocol, kind of like Ripple. And that means that we are not bound by shortest path. We can actually send across any path on the fabric because we do. it's a loop-free protocol. You cannot build loops. A packet goes up in the fabric until it turns down southbound, and then it continues southbound until it hits the destination. And that opens a completely new set of design choices uh, in terms of protocol, you know, and also improves the behavior drastically because you don't get this diffusion of information through the network where multiple fronts collide and need to reconcile. The thing just goes up and down. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the principles. Um, uh, let me connect it for a second to our previous <clears throat> session. We all know uh, mm -hmm. DMZ community for BGP, right? It's a community that's attached to a prefix that assigns a weight to it. Gives you ability to do weighted load sharing towards the prefix. If you look at implementation, implementation is non-transitive, <clears throat> meaning you learn it on uh, external link where you run eBGP and then advertise it towards your IBGP peers. So next hop gets unchanged. This is not the model we do in data center where we mostly run eBGP. What it really means that you cannot propagate the community. So there's number of implementations that actually do break this assumption so it became transitive however every time you reset next hop you kind of lose this information moreover you've got the aggregation of next hops into single next hop as you go down so unless you can summarize this information again it becomes pretty much unusable so significant amount of problems being discussed in atf as we speak right now actually in adr working group uh dmz community doesn't work properly and we are trying to rework it for bgp reef does this natively so any host at the bottom of the fabric knows exactly how much traffic to send and it's done hop by hop so you never get the hot spots or you don't lose the information because of aggregation all right i mean and that that is rooted in first the principle that rift does not care about shortest path it can send along any path and it will be loop free and get there and second it has topology information it's not like bgp where you don't see topology you just get a prefix which annotated and you make some guesses right rift has the topology 
but you know this is all very much detail of protocol operation. Uh, the other thing is there is a Rift um, supports uh, prefix mobility about twice as fast as any other protocol. We can talk about the concepts and actually you know, a lot of the stuff has been done from Pascal uh, Tuber from Cisco, you know, brilliant guy who worked, he's actually one of the main authors of Ripple, uh, who helped me a lot of the stuff and the refactor actually wrote of Rift uh, during, you know, the last two years or so. Um, so that was an interesting thing because people care about the prefix mobility and actually Rift can de uh, uh, detect mobility versus any cast, which is a non-trivial problem, right? Because the same prefix shows up twice and you have to decide what is it real fast if you want to do it well. Um, right, I mean, one of the byproducts of the fact that we're not bound by shortest path, we can actually do any cast pretty well because we can send to an address via any viable path. So we can take addresses which are not at the same you know, distance and we can send to both and load balance and Rift works just fine, which you cannot do with shortest path protocols. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the operational advantages. There's surely more. We stumble over that, but... Um, I think that's and again, right. bringing it back for a second to BGP, we spent significant amount of time going and talking about fast convergence and loop free requirements for that. So you can only use particular paths as a backup to primary if it's loop free. Uh, in BGP, loop freeness could be achieved over ECMP. So as we said, we could use fast rehash rather than using complex LFA like computation. In Rift, none of this is needed. Any prefix could be backed up by another prefix because it is loop free per definition. So we remove this dependency. It can provision hardware backups that are sub 50 milliseconds and could be done based on variety of administrative metrics. Uh, and, and here's an interesting observation on top because I, I think that uh, it's so obvious to me, I don't even mention that. Uh, Rift works over absolutely standard IP silicon. There is no magic required by some proprietary silicon extension, anything like that. It just needs uh, your normal IP forwarding chip that does the longest prefix match and you're in the business, right? There is no requirements for labels or any segments or anything funky. It's just your old plain IP forwarding, but it's just, you know, the control plan is built in a way that we make sure that it doesn't produce loops, you know, and it doesn't, have, it doesn't need SPF really. Yeah, so I think more will come to the fore. Um, yeah, now it gets a little bit boring, a couple of terms. Um, uh, yeah, let's do that quickly. So uh, maybe let's keep to the one with the basic principle, with the four principles, and I think then we go back to terminology because that will be more interesting. Uh, no, one forward. Yeah, right. So. Um, I think that that is something, you know, that if you if you leave after this view graph, you already got probably 80% of the meat, you know, you're well educated, you know, why Rift is a cool thing, you, know, you can go have your ice cream. And, <laughs> and then we start to talk like, you know, terminology and words and all the boring, you know, we slaughter the pig and make it sausage. So, um, Rift as a protocol, and that's really rooted again in the epistemology, the great word, right? Like, what do you know? Know, how do you know that you know that he knows that you know, right? Uh, so four principles really. So the, the most fundamental thing is that Rift understands a concept of direction. Rift is an unusual routing protocol in the sense that it knows what is north and what is south. So we are not operating on arbitrary meshes when you t think about, you know, uh, in terms of graph theory. We are arbitrary. Uh, we are operating on something which are something called lattices, you know, partial orders. So it could be applicable to a lot of other topologies, but you know, Claw is the only practical, as far as I see, of interest. So, so the protocol knows what is north and what is south, and what is west and east, but that's not that interesting. Um, so the only configuration really that Rift needs, you have to tell the top of the fabric that this is the very top. That's the only configuration you really need. You know, it could be one button on an Ethernet switch light, right? This is, this is the top of the fabric. This is north. Everything, you know, comes from there. Uh, so that allows us, forget topological sort, it's such as a fancy word, right? That allows us to number where are you in the fabric. And we chose the concept of a level. Everything else was just too overloaded as a word. So we, we count from the bottom, funny enough, and we can 
talk about why that makes sense because we started to come from the top that does not make sense when you build the protocol so you can imagine that the very bottom is level zero but it could be it doesn't have to be zero and the next one is just one level higher up so level zero level one and the top is level two but the rift supports arbitrary heights right so that was one of the problems as well that you saw with traditional protocol right that BGP, if you look at the numbering scheme, pretty much you can get away with five stage claw and from there on it gets really iffy because you need so many funky AS tricks that you're playing. Um, ISIS, even if you try to do some kind of level games, you end up at two levels, so SP of same. Rift supports, whatever, the number is uh, arbitrary, but uh, I think we kept it like the, the, the default is 24, the very top. So you could build up to 24 levels which for practical purposes seems more than enough people are building skyscrapers building claw fabrics in them you know but i thought that you no know, 24 is already a pretty good number so that's the first concept uh, that you always has to be in the back of your mind that the rift knows what is not what is south the second one is that it's a at the second and the third so you can think about rift in simple terms as something that is a link state protocol going north and a distance vector going down and now why would that make sense well because the top of the fabric needs the full view of topology you know if the packet arrives at the very top in the famous words of Eisenhower, the buck stops there. I think it was Eisenhower, right? So the guy, the red guy at the very top has to make the decision which way to go. He cannot defer it by bumping the packet up. Whereas everybody below, if they don't have the topology information, they can just bump it up. So that's number three. So basically, in a normal fabric without any failures, well cabled, the only thing is a defer route. So if you look at number three, the distance vector, you basically just pass a D4 out down. And everybody has a D4 out to the top. So if they know where is the prefix southbound, they turn the packet around. And if not, they just bump it up. So that's why this kind of hybrid of both turns out to have all these desirable properties that we, that we were looking for. And the last one, that's the number four, the one layer bounds, something which is not obvious originally. Um, we will see that a lot of algorithms that are very beneficial to operation of the protocol, the switches at the same level have to be aware of each other. Uh, so for the green ones across the pot, so the two green guys have to be aware that there's the other guy and what connectivity he has. But now since we said that we run only a distance protocol down, distance vector and pass the D4 out, there are no horizontal links. And the flooding only goes up, so these guys will never see each other. So the way we solve the problem is that the node description, think OSPF LSA, is being bounced by the level below. So the red guys get the bouncing so they see each other through the bounds of the lower level and the green guys do the same. And the leaves are not aware of each other because there's absolutely no reason they should. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's it in a nutshell. You're fully educated. You, you can talk about Rift, you know, uh, in a well-informed way, you know, not necessarily wisely, but well-informed. Uh, so um, we can now start to skip back to some terminology because, you know, we, we need a language that is well-defined to start to talk about, you know, some of these concepts which are pretty radically new, like the ZTP, how does ZTP work, right? So normally people talk about the spine aggregation leaf level and uh, that is super spine, super super spine this terminology is very loosely defined and when you start to talk about really high fabric multi-plane fabric uh, you get confused really quickly so basically that's why we introduce levels right so you can you can think about leaves as level zero and you can think about spine as level one and super spine level two and it carries right but we have this concept of a level which allows us to basically talk it you know very in a very abstract way no matter how high is the fabric um, pot is pretty well understood, right? Uh, it's uh, uh, point of delivery, so basically it's a vertical slide. It's one of these things that you hook up to the very top of the fabric that connects all the pots together. Um, spine, we already had it. Uh, uh, important term in Rift is the top, the top of fabric. Uh, so the very, very 
last guys at the very top. And why they're important? Because that's where everything starts. Those are the only guys who have to be marked up special. They are the top of the fabric. They are the spot, single point of truth for everything that happens later, right? In terms of direction. You didn't start uh, the terminology in five stage. Network top is going to be the super spine layer. Yeah, so that's, you know, like we had this picture before, you can, you know, relate to the colors. I think red was the very top of fabric. And then, yep. yeah, we talk about directions, right? So we said that the compass, the compass rose is very important for it. So we can talk about northbound link and southbound link and east-west link. You know, each link has a direction depending whom you build adjacency to. So that directionality is uh, of, you know, high importance when you talk terminology-wise. Mm, that's it. We have another one. Yeah, so we spend a lot of time about talking about uh, ESI multi-homing in a VPN. Mm -hmm. One of most important reasons here is not to have east-west links in cloud apologies. I mean, somewhat independent of what we're describing now, but yeah, so Rift horizontal links are really bad. They break basic assumptions about uh, graph right. theory and how cloud topology should behave. So Rift supports east-west links, but it's kind of the uh, complex discussion. So east-west links are not bad if you use them for control plane convergence. They actually have a lot of beneficial properties. They become pretty sucky if you start to forward traffic through them and you expect, you know, your blocking probabilities to hold up and so on. Uh, but Rift supports it, but it's kind of a footnote, quite advanced discussion we probably should have much later. So. Rift terminology, you know, it's always fun to invent the language, especially if you can make a lot of puns. Now, why would you not use the same terminology as ISIS? Uh, just because things are very often almost the same, but not quite. So if you don't have a proper language and uh, we just lost the shared screen. Okay, okay, something happened. Okay, I don't know, me alone now. Um, so if, if we start to talk about Rift terminology, there, uh, uh, we defined basically a clean language and we, we can relate it to the old protocols, but we always have a proper word, you know, so we know it, what, what we're talking about. So TAI stands for topology information element and that's basically an LSP in ISIS. That's something that carries information around, you can flood around. And because we have directionality, we actually have south ties and north ties. Because don't forget, the flooding only goes north. So if you uh, start uh, flooding north ties, they will only go north and they keep the direction. And the south ties are used for a couple of things, like, for example, bouncing, right? So just remember tie, uh, easy to remember, is for something carries information. Then we have the node tie, which is um, similar to OSP at node LSA, but uh, different again because we don't have a single one. We can have multiples and they carry other information than OSP. So it's good to, to, call, no, to have a name for it. We have a prefix tie that carries prefixes. We have a key value tie. We didn't talk about it, but Rift supports a key value store and it has a lot of interesting use cases. Um, again, a side discussion. And if you are into ISIS, the PIT, which stands for Topology Information Description Element, is kind of the same thing as CSMP. And the TIRE, which stands for Request Element, is the same thing as a PSMP. So you can request and, and acknowledge. Flooding looks very close to ISIS because, in my opinion, ISIS solves flooding almost perfectly. A couple of things that we didn't catch in ISI is Rift Souls as well, like, you know, not checksumming sequence number and so on. We can talk about this stuff later. Uh, let's forget PGP to advance. A lie, of course, you tell each other lies to build the trust relationship, right? So that basically stands for link information element. It's just a hello. But again, it carries a lot of interesting stuff that ISI's hellos don't carry. That, so it's good to have its own word. So you send lies to get ties. And to make sure you get the ties, you exchange tights and tires. And that's pretty much all. And again, top of the fabric, because it's so, so important. It will come up so many times. And with that, you are, you know, an, a, one of the eclectic few who actually talk, you know, rift terminology. You know, you can talk ties and lies. And that's about as much as there is. I will be using the stuff cautiously and still, you know, explain every time I talk about things what, you know, I will, I will um, 
expound, you know, or I will expand on the acronyms every time I talk about it for a while. So yeah, so we have to brace the concept. Now, that is beautiful, and that explains how the whole CTP works, right? Um, which is what, so, you know, we can talk about CTP, we can talk about the disaggregation thing, there is oodles of things, security and so on. ZTP is now a good topic, but you gentlemen have to drive the discussion. Do we go in something like explaining how ZTP works, or we start to crossroad something, or what's the plan? So I would think uh, it's a good point to stop and, uh, oh, sorry. We grew what? Up, yeah. uh, and, uh, I think I would, we've yeah. got about uh, five minutes, and so this is probably a good place to uh, to stop and, and take up these more detailed conversations uh, in the yeah. next show. But I've I've got a question. I've sort of been holding through the uh, through the whole discussion. Uh, you know, you, yeah. every everything looked so good that I'm I'm sort of in listening mode a lot more than um, than host mode, I guess. But um, you know, you you've talked about all of these capabilities. Uh, you know, and and there's so many yeah. improvements over uh, simple IGPs or BGP and and all of that. Uh, what is the cost that you pay for that? Is uh, you know, is there a heavier load on on uh, router CPU memory that sort of thing? Um, okay, very interesting discussion. Well, so um, I mean, there was a lot of concerns, right? Yes, it's radical, of course, right? Um, uh, there was a lot of concerns. Uh, and, you know, I was also inspired by some very small people like Open R that were doing things that I thought were mildly crazy until I went and tried in my bedroom and I said like, oh, the game has changed. The world looks different. The one, for example, very big concern was uh, uh, model-based encoding of packets. Mm -hmm. I know that it would be ungodly expensive. On today's CPUs, it's an utterly neglectable cost. Literally, it doesn't even blip on the radar. Really? Uh, the second thing, and that, you know, we start to go into implementation. RIP is written in a radical way compared to BGP or SPF because the spec is optimized for parallel implementation. And that is an utterly different game. All the protocols we built were very tightly interwoven for a single thread of execution because we had one CPU core, right? That was the thing for the 20 years. Today's the cores are dimes a dozen and they don't get faster. If anything, they're getting slower because of power. So the Rift is geared from the spec, from the bottom up to very easy parallel implementation. And when you start to implement stuff on parallel cores, all of a sudden you can burn CPU like there will be no tomorrow, okay? So uh, here goes another answer. The third answer is that how much Rift you implement depends on how high you are in the fabric. If you're on the server, you really just talk to your northbound guys, you exchange hellos, you get a D4 out, you're done. You may get a couple of disaggregates, you're done. You don't have to implement disaggregation, you don't have to implement uh, uh, bouncing on flooding. Your flooding looks really trivial, right? The farther you go up in the fabric, the more link state you hold and the more complex algorithms you're running. So at the top, you want you know, if you build a huge fabric, you may want pretty beefy boxes, but there are very few, right? So it's an anisotropic protocol. So that changes the game again uh, very much, right? The farther down you go, the more boxes you have, the simpler the protocol implementation gets, both CPU-wise and memory-wise. Now, in terms of practical implementation, um, uh, it is actually... Um, I would say it is cheaper than ISIS in terms of load. But, but you know, well, one of the reasons is that if you run ISIS on the fabric, don't forget ISIS was built for sparse meshes. If you have very low fan out, then I would venture to say Rift may be somewhat more expensive, but the cost is so small. But we are talking fan outs 128 to 56 links. ISIS starts to struggle especially in topology like that. And we can talk about flood reduction why it only helps tune and extend, but not really. Whereas the rift, already the flooding volume is only about 20% of an IGP, comparable IGP. So you already have one fifth of the load of flooding. So you can actually be pretty generous with your CPU cycles when you process a packet. 
But overall, I mean, uh, sizable topology, uh, I, I mean, I give you like a real implementation number, whatever that means, right? Written in some language and so on. Um, on a low end Broadwell CPU, uh, maintaining 30 links and doing all the stuff as a Tor shows up as one, 2% of CPU. Eh, less than that, half a percent with spikes, maybe 8%, something like that. So overall, no, it's actually fairly cheap, I would say. It's, it's, it's not, even at very large scale, I mean, we were scaling the stuff to hundreds of thousands of prefixes. It behaves very reasonable. But again, this is so implementation dependent. It just takes one linear walk through an array, right? <laughs> yes. So complex answer, I guess. No, that's that's a great answer, and and I think it's a good place for us to um, to uh, end the show today. I've actually got about a dozen more questions, but. Um, I'm learning a bunch. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've read the uh, internet draft and, and felt like I knew this pretty well, but, uh, uh, but listening to you talk about it, this is, uh, this is a treat for me and, and, um, and I think a treat for uh, all of the folks uh, in our audience. And, and Tony, I want to thank you uh, profusely for joining us today. And this, this has just been terrific. And uh, um, and hopefully we'll we'll continue this in, in the next show. Uh, Jeff, you have any final words? Yeah, for planning wise, we will uh, occupy Tony for quite some time. He should be, you know, expecting right. more invitations. We'll uh, because we we've just described kind of basic functionality. We didn't talk about disaggregation, and this is one of the most interesting properties of the protocol. So we talked about. In ability to aggregate in BGP, this is what we've done automatically. And this is going to be topic, one of the topics of the next discussion. We'll make sure Tony is here as well to, you know, <laughs> to entertain, entertain us. And uh, please, please send your questions. We are here to answer them. And as always, it was great to see Jeff and Tony. And we will see each other very soon. There is a question on the chat that I'd like to answer. So what are the default timers for Rift? A uh, complex question, let's not talk about flooding, let's just talk quickly um, uh, about the hellos. So Rift has uh, built in negotiation. So the idea behind Rift is not that you are sitting on an IGP adjacency and wait three seconds. When Rift comes up, uh, because it's full ZTP, it also negotiates BFT. So the BFT sessions come up automatically on the links if both sides say they are BFT capable. And then the question is, you know, how, you know, how tight can you squeeze down your BFD? And that's largely hardware dependent. Great. I hope that is satisfactory. And flooding is too long of a discussion. Okay. And thanks, uh, thanks uh, for noticing the question. I was so focused on this, I didn't even notice the, the question in the chat. Um, so with that, uh we'll we'll close it down for this uh this week and we will see all of you back in two weeks thanks for yep. joining us yeah thanks for having me here i hope it was you now entertaining 45 minutes for everyone thanks everyone it was great bye 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 have a great day everyone